Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for all joining us this afternoon. My name is Dani Gilad from the YWC Yakima. I am the Community Outreach Coordinator. And part of what we're presenting this week, which is Week Without Violence, part of a global movement from the YWCA USA to really share conversation stories, information of how we all can practice safe behaviors, how we can all interrupt any forms of violence. And ultimately, that set goal of ending, ending gender violence at all forms. Um, so this afternoon, we're starting the conversation with Osman Victim Advocacy Services, and I have Debbie Brockman, who's joined me today in the conversation. We're going to go through some of her roles. Um, you know, what is it that their agency serves here in Yakima City? Um, you know, what's the coverage? You know, how can people get in connection with you, or how do they reach out to your office? Um, you know, what's the primary focus of a lot of the services that you guys do provide? Um, and then really give a big familiarity to our community members. So we all have access to this, all of these resources and really target much awareness and connecting people to those resources that they might need here in the city and or the Yakima County area. So welcome, Debbie. How are we feeling today? Feeling good. Feeling good. good. Thank you for joining me. So I want to make sure that I'm not the only one speaking. So I'm going to pass over the mic to you and just let us know who you are who you're representing, and then kind of go down to um, just your agency and programs. Okay, sounds good. Um, my phone is ringing. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, so, um, as um, Daniela said, I am uh, the program manager for Aspen Victim Advocacy Services, and we are a program that's under the umbrella of comprehensive health care. Uh, and Comprehensive Healthcare is a, an agency that provides um, a full range of, of mental health services and substance use disorder services in multiple counties in Central and Eastern Washington. Uh, so uh, Aspen is one of those programs. And what we are is we're a community sexual assault program called a CSAP. Um, and we are also a crime victim service center. And um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we do it, through each of those programs. So community sexual assault programs are uh, what used to be called um, like rape crisis centers. So we provide a um, full range of advocacy services to, to victims and survivors of, of sexual assault. And that means that we provide services to adults and children, and we provide services to all genders. And, um, and we pr also provide services to, to adults who are survivors of childhood sexual trauma. And so um, as, as a CSEP, we're an accredited pr uh, program. We're accredited through the Office of, of Crime Victim Advocacy. And we provide um, just uh, with crisis response. We provide, uh, we have a 24 hour hotline so a person who is in need of services or just needs to talk to somebody, have somebody to listen to them. Um, we have a 24 hour coverage by a trained advocate. Um, we, do, um, we do a lot of providing information and, and on resources in the community. We can help get them connected if, with other types of resources, counseling, um, whatever it is that they may need. Um, we do legal advocacy, which means um, that we, if there's a criminal case that's going on, or or maybe even they're just wanting to start an investigation, um, we will help them make a police report. We'll help them to understand the criminal justice system and how, and what happens once you make a police report. So we kind of walk alongside of that um, survivor um, throughout the process of having a criminal case. Um, not all cases end up uh, getting charged. So there's not always, there's not always, even after a report is made, there's not always a criminal case that's happening. We still provide advocacy really for as long as somebody uh, is, is wanting it. Um, we'll go to court with them. We'll go to, to if they have to do interviews with uh, maybe a detective or they have to do interviews with a prosecutor defense attorney, throughout the process, there's multiple interviews, and we'll, we'll make sure that we are there with them 
uh, we're just providing them with support, making sure that their needs are being um, tended to and that, um, that, that it's not an easy thing to do an interview. So we're just there to help, help make sure that they're taken care of. Um, we also do medical advocacy and um, we respond uh, to area hospitals uh, when a victim is going for a sexual assault examination, um, also called a rape kit. Um, so 24 seven, um, we will go and be with somebody while they're going through that, that process. And it's usually the hospital that gives us a call and asks us to come in. Um, we also uh, work with many community partners like the YWCA to make sure that um, that regardless of where um, a victim may be injured, whether it's in the city of Yakima or if it's out in the, in the, uh, in the county or in a, a rural area, that all victims are getting um, the best possible um, advocacy and the best possible response. Uh, and uh, also just to um, make sure that we're providing a coordinated community response to both domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, and we, another, the, another thing we do is we provide like some system coordination. Um, so that's where we can maybe bring together the different people that are involved, like the law enforcement, prosecutors, advocates, and, and, um, and staff cases and make sure that, that, um, that we're all keeping the victim safety and what's kind of in the best interest of the, of the victim in mind uh, throughout the case. So that's what kind of an overview of, a, of our community sexual assault program. Then we're also a crime victim service center. And what that means is that we provide the same type of services, everything that I just laid out, but we do that for victims of crimes other than domestic violence and sexual assault. So that could be um, maybe a vehicular homicide. Um, it could be um, a, a, an assault. It could be a, we provide advocacy to surviving family members of a homicide victim. Um, we help them with things like filing for crime victims compensation to get assistance with burial expenses or um, medical expenses, um, that type of thing. So, um, so regardless of what type of a crime you are a victim of, you can get services in Yakima County um, through one of the agencies. Um, and so, um, that's what we do. We also provide the crime victim advocacy in Kittitas County. That was a lot. You guys are absolutely a busy crew and the team has a lot of power and strength, um, definitely. Um, can you tell me, Zevi, if your agency serves just adults or do you also work with young people? We, we work with um, all ages. So across the lifespan. So we, we work with small children. We work with, um, you know, adolescents, uh, we um, adults, you know, and we, we even, we, we also work with, um, with the elderly populations. And so, um, so, every, so regardless of age, we, we do provide services. Um, we're trying to do even more with uh, more services with youth around the, around prevention. Um, I would, but with our sexual assault program, I would say that more than 50%, and this is consistent from year to year, more than 50% of the people that we serve are children who have been victims of some form of sexual assault, which is yeah. really, really troubling. And, um, and it's in those sexual assaults are usually um, happening, not from a stranger, very rarely a stranger, but usually from a family member or an or a an acquaintance of the family. That has to be hard. How do like families normally get connected to you guys if it's a case where a child has been harmed? So we receive referrals from um, a number of different organizations, but the most common ones are we receive referrals from law enforcement and we, we receive them for, uh, referrals from the prosecutor's office. We also receive referrals from our Child Advocacy Center. Um, the Child Advocacy Center is where, um, where a, a child can come and be interviewed um, by a forensic interviewer in a very safe, child-friendly um, location um, by somebody who's trained to interview children. And, um, and then while the child's being interviewed, the, 
the family member who brought the child is also getting services and advocacy and support um, because it's, you know, they're usually really distressed and, and kind of in crisis as, as well. So, um, and the Child Advocacy Center just recently added um, a uh, dog to their office. And so there's now, um, his, the dog's name is Diamond. And so it just, the, 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 um, the dog is trained for this purpose and can sit in um, on forensic interviews with children. And it's really effective in just calming them down and making them feel, um, feel even safer. And, and the dog just picks up on like what the child needs. And, and so it's a wonderful thing. So yeah, so we get referrals from, from those places. We also get referrals from um, the hospital. Um, and, and then just a lot of uh, um, referrals um, just from people calling us on our hotline. Um, and so then th that could often be because they've gotten uh, one of our flyers has been given to them by somebody um, or they've received um, something in the mail from the prosecutor's office and that has our phone number in it as well. So. Thank you. Wow. Um, that sounds really comforting. I think for a parent just kind of being worried of what the process is going to look like and if there will be some support just to kind of go from, you know, step A all the way to step D or E um, and then assuring that there's a, a handful team a village, you know, working with a child who's under crisis or just simply going through a traumatic event as getting interviewed um, and the crime that they've experienced, I, I can only imagine. So that would be a big, a big relief for a parent to know that um, our county and our city is definitely working towards relieving that for a child. Right. Make, um, you know, it's not, it's never easy, but we just try to make it as, is um, comfortable and is uh, make sure that the child is feeling safe at every every step of the way. Yeah, thank you, Debbie. Can you share if there's any cost to any of the services that you guys provide? No, no cost for any any services. We're a um, nonprofit organization and we're primarily grant funded, and um, and there they'll never be you'll never be billed for any services. And we, uh, in addition to that, we can help um, individuals file their crime victim compensation claim so that they won't get billed for, for our other services as well, like counseling, or if they had to have a medical appointment, so things like that. Thank you for sharing that. I know there, there has been a question like during the pandemic and during some of the political crisis that we're going through, as far as being questioned for their immigration status, is it something that comes to in your office of being asked that question? No, absolutely not. We don't, we, there, um, everybody is welcome to receive services in our, in our, um, in our office and, um, and immigration status is definitely not something, um, that is relevant to that. The, the only times that we might be asking or talking about, um, immigration status is, is in order to get them connected with legal resources that might be able to help them. They may have some kind of a, um, a, a avenue to um, becoming documented, and we want to make sure that they're that um, we're not missing any any uh, opportunities to get them the legal help that they need. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, I mean, absolutely knowing that support and assuring that that question might not come forward because then you you might have people that are afraid to come and reach out to someone who's helping you make a report on where that might lead or if it affects me if I have a case pending or whatever that looks like. What is directly the crisis line number that you guys have to your office that I can share? The number, it's 509-452-9675. And this crisis line number is directly 24-7 or how would you share the line number? It's, that num it's 24-7 and honestly, that's the best way um, to get a hold of um, an advocate. Um, our, um, our advocates who are working Monday through Friday, the normal business hours, um, they rotate. And so there's always somebody that's answering the hotline for that day. And then um, after hours, so on evenings and weekends, we, it's either, there's always either a staff person that's available or um, one of our trained volunteers. Um, so um, you'll, you're guaranteed to get a live person to talk to if you call that number. That's always good to know. Is your platform to the hotline available for people to reach out through a chat or a text? 
it is not at this time. It's not. And so um, that's definitely something that we need to, we're looking into how we can, if we can be um, utilize text since that's that a lot of people like to text. We yes. do, um, it, once we're working with a client, if they are, uh, we, we, we usually ask for their, if they, if they indicate that they'd like to text, then we just, um, we ask them to give a sign an authorization for text messaging, and then they can communicate with their advocate through text messaging. That's great. Another question for you, Debbie, are you guys meeting people in person at this time? We are, we are, we're, you know, we're, um, we're all, our whole team is fully vaccinated. Um, we're part of comprehensive health care, which has been uh, uh, extremely conscientious about um, being at safety during during um, COVID. Um, but we are meeting with people. Masks are required when you come in the uh, come in the building, and um, you know we are meeting in spaces that allow for for social distancing. Um, but it's for us that's that has proven to be. Um, the most effective way is to be able to still meet a person. We offer the the um, alternatives of having either phone appointments or we can do a virtual appointment. We can do do like this. We can we can meet with them. Um, we so we often do meet with clients in our offices, um, but we all are mobile advocates, and so we can meet with clients um, wherever uh, it's best for them. So if we um, we need to go on, go out to one of the more rural communities or just um, they don't have transportation. We try to do our best to overcome um, any barriers that prevent them from getting the services that they need. So we're pretty Great. accommodating. Yeah. Will that also include like language access if they're not able to speak in English? Absolutely. Yes. Um, and so, and obviously, there's more languages in this Spanish, but in our community, um, it's very helpful to be bilingual. And so all of our advocates, except for me, are bilingual in English and Spanish. Great, that's really good. Um, I think I just wanna leave it up in open space right now. If there's any like program update that you'd like to share or something that you absolutely want the community to know, because uh, I know it could be scary when you are in a crisis situation or just have gone through a traumatic incident or events that you have sometimes no means of connecting or if you've been isolated in that situation like you have no connection to resources so is there like a special message or something that you want to relate to the community today um yeah a couple of things um one i um even if you're feeling like like you're not really sure if um if you need an advocate or if you you know uh, Oftentimes I hear people think, well, my situation is not that bad. Other people need the services more than I do. Um, and I just uh, encourage people that if you, if, you, um, if you need help, no matter if it's big or small, just reach out to us. Um, and, um, and we're never, we're never going to think that, that, that your situation isn't, isn't worthy um, of, of our time and our, our efforts. And, I just really want um, uh, everybody to know that we we don't work with uh, when we meet a person. We're not just thinking thinking of them as about what happened to them, this incident that happened to them, which might be the worst thing that ever happened to them. But we we care about the whole person, and um, and so our advocacy is very holistic in that um, they, maybe they had this situation that happened, um, that is a, a crime that occurred, but also over here, they're still, de they're dealing with, um, uh, of the loss of a job or they're dealing with, um, they're about to maybe lose their housing, uh, or, or they don't quite know how to, they want to go to school, but they're not quite sure how, whatever the issue that that person and their family are dealing with, we're going to try to um, get them connected and help them overcome all the barriers that are happening in their life. So we're not solely focused on this, um, the whether it's a sexual assault or, or another type of crime that has occurred, we want to help the, the whole person. Um, and also, um, you know, I've been doing this kind of advocacy work for a 
for decades now. And um, it's really important that we continue to provide all the services that we've talked about to provide the intervention and, and be there for people who have been, already been victimized. But more and more, we, we know and we realize that we need to put um, a lot more of our time and our resources towards doing the, the work of prevention. And uh, when we talk about doing prevention work, we're talking about you know, wanting to make a difference, wanting to intervene, intervene before um, the crime has occurred, what, you know, whether it's a domestic violence or a sexual assault that, that has occurred. Um, and, and that's something that we, in the, over the last few years, have really been trying to, um, to do, is to, to actually get out there and do some prevention work. And um, so how we're doing that is we're doing it through, uh, we, we're going to Madison House, uh, we're go do, going to the space, we're going to places where, to other youth serving organizations, because it's just way easier if we come to them and make our services available. Um, and uh, then if they, to have them come to us, we're also, but we also do a group where we're, we're with uh, middle school students where, um, we do, um, have it, have the groups here, but if they need transportation, we'll go pick them up from school. Um, we had a whole group that were from the same middle school. And so we just, we have, we have the bus ready for, to bring them, bring them here for the class. Um, but our, our prevention groups, we're trying to focus from middle school through high school at this point. And if you know anybody, or if you have a child, um, or if you are a youth and you are interested in um, seeing what this prevention work looks like and coming to some of our groups, um, we, we, we talk about some serious stuff, but we also just really try to have fun. So uh, please feel free to reach out to Aspen and get more information about that. Yep, and I think that I think that's pretty much what I want what I want everybody to know. I think I'm frozen. Oh no. Are you able to hear me? Yeah, I can you're not frozen on my from what I can see. Oh, that's so interesting. Okay. Yeah, so um my webinar is soon to be freezing, but I think what we'll do is kind of close off the session. Hopefully um, in, individuals gather so much information. I appreciate all the work that you guys do at Aspen. Thank you so much for spending some time, Debbie. I definitely want to push that forward in getting some of our young people involved and work with prevention purposes, You know, shifting that culture and getting those conversations started will definitely help us make that bridge and in interrupting any future violence. Uh, when our young people become adults. So absolutely important. Again, this part of the series is to get that community resource out, but to also spread awareness during this month of October, which is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Um, we want people to spark change, even if it's just getting the word out or just being informed and aware of what's in your community. So um, if that's something that you can help us openly do today or during this month, and the following months of the year, we would absolutely appreciate it. Um, when we say NDV, we want to end it in all forms and all aspects of it. Because um, there's a lot to learn about domestic violence, correct? Um, and yeah. we can learn even just by being aware today and having those conversations started. All right, any last message that you want to close off today, Debbie? Um, I would just say that um, the Aspen Victim Advocacy Advocacy Services is just fully behind our, our domestic violence programs in the county, the YWCA and the Lighthouse. And, um, and the, the, the bottom line is that domestic violence and sexual assault are 100% preventable. And we just need to make the changes as a, as a society that, that will not tolerate uh, gender-based violence or violence in general um, at all. So. Thank you, Danny, for doing this. And thank you for the YWCA and all that you guys are doing uh, to end domestic violence. Absolutely. It takes the whole village. And we're talking about an entire community of shifting this conversation and really sparking to make that change. 
So yes, absolutely. It's 100% preventable, preventable, and it starts now. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. If you do have any questions, again, remember Aspen Victim Advocacy Crisis Hotline, 509-452-9675. It is 24-7 available to you and to meet the survivor or victim wherever that is or however we can meet them and get that, get that connection going. Our hotline for the YWC Yakima is 509-248-7796. Again, you can reach us via any social media platform, as well as that number 24 seven. All right, well, thank you all so much for joining. I will be closing off the session. Uh, please do send us any questions that you have or just simply call us. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm having a, a tough time pausing. Are you able to pause the recording on your end at all? Let me see if I can. Mine is just completely frozen on my control panel, so I can't even see. When I try to, to stop it, it says I have to have permission from the host. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, let's see. I was afraid I was going to have Zoom problems again, and oh, it's so irritating. The good thing is that if I do stop it, um, I want to make sure that I will edit what we don't need on there. Yeah. 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 So it just won't let you stop the recording, huh? It just will not. No. I don't understand that. See, will it let you make me the host and then I could try? I can't even see anything on my control panel. Oh, really? The whole thing? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see here. Participant. Like now my screen is black, so I can't, I can't see anything. <laughs> oh, this well, is maybe. Scary. I wonder if, if what happens if we just leave the meeting. Um, it's saving it to the cloud, so. I should still save it to the cloud. Okay. Okay, well, I am going to go ahead and, and um, sign off the meeting then. Okay, that's and, fine. And wish you well. <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> I'm wishing myself well as well right now. <laughs> okay. Talk okay, thank you, Debbie. You're welcome. Good job. Bye. You too. Bye.